What do you think? I'll be honest, I wasn't paying attention. I was trying to figure out what was going on. No kidding. <laughs> well, Patrick, you got my back, and I really appreciate it. Basically, what we're trying to do is elevate ourselves as trombone players. And typically, the thing that, that uh, we do, we're, we're good uh, crafts people. In the music world, us trombone players, we tend to focus on the technique of making just solid bricks of sound. And what I find interesting is um, when you look at the, the music world in general, we trombone players aren't as uh, highly regarded as great musicians. And I think that this is a really simple problem to fix. If we just start each day trying to be inspired, right? In, by like focusing on really inspiring musicians, looking outside of the trombone world to actually find uh, um, really great examples of inspiring musicians that are interesting to listen to. Now, the thing that I was uh, pointing out before um, I unmuted myself on the YouTube channel was that uh, typically our, uh, our great examples of musicianship are uh, people that are uh, being super interesting with a very little effort or very little perceived effort. So the, the vocalist that I want to put in front of you today is creating a great deal of spin in her sound, right? But you can tell how she's holding her body uh, and how she's doing her tone production, moving the air, is with, with very, very little effort. So what we're trying to do then is to try to glean as much as we can from her uh, grand musical shape, but also to try to understand how she's moving the air so easily, right? Um, we want to be able to generate great, beautiful sound with very little effort. Now, you yourself, if we're just talking about separate of this uh, beautiful music that we're going to listen to, this is if you want to uh, look on IMSLP, it's uh, Kershaw, Mozart Kershaw number 339. All right? Um, so if we are preparing for this, what we essentially will do is notice when we get tired. I was having a conversation with uh, somebody who, who did a parade earlier, and uh, Brad, you were indicating that you got tired. I, it's not without uh, uh, purpose. I also get tired myself when I'm playing. And usually when I get tired, I, I walk it back to say, like, there must have been something that I was doing earlier that I used more effort than was necessary. Right? And I, I quickly go into problem solving mode. Typically, when you notice that you're tired, um, you'll, uh, you'll, you, you, you kind of go into triage mode. You're like, okay, I've got to get to the end of the service without embarrassing myself. Uh, that's what I think. Like, I'll be in a pops program or a, a really heavy concert in the Boston Symphony, and, uh, and, I, and I notice that I'm tired. I'm like, oh, okay, I need to be careful here so that I can get through the rest of the concert without making a fool of myself, right? Um, so uh, I identify tension in my body and effort in my tone production and try to eliminate it. Now, if you're tired, you might not be able to eliminate it completely. But if you problem solve the concert, oftentimes you can walk it back to say, where was the place that I was kind of like really flexing my arm or moving the air and I was super tight? Uh, is there a way that I could have put that more on my breath support than my facial muscles, right? or even the airspeed, could I have reduced the airspeed somehow and gotten uh, more sound for the amount of uh, effort and airspeed that I was putting into it. So um, anyways, these are, uh, maybe uh, I'm, I'm talking too much. Let's, let's listen to this beautiful uh, aria here. Um, let me put the music up on for you. Uh, here's this, let's get me out of there. There we go. And I'll just be off in a corner, how's that?
Just checking on my Zoom friends. Can you hear it now? You can? OK. So it, it had to do with uh, you guys are hearing in the secondary feed. Um, bear with me. Let's just keep going, OK? So moving forward, um, essentially we're dealing with, um, I, I have to figure out how to get Ecamm to give the sound to Zoom right now. So it's um, a probably a better sound product on YouTube right now than it is <laughs> on Zoom. Uh, so, uh, but uh, essentially what you're seeing me do here is to take dictation, musical dictation. I'm trying to grab where she's breathing and I'm also trying to um, take note of her dynamic structure. Now, it should be pretty clear, because we have the words in front of us, the general effect of articulation. It should be sort of uh, sostenuto with varying amounts of marcato. We, sometimes the attack is firm, and other times the attack is very gentle, depending on the phoneme that we have. That would be like, a, for example, here you have a Q, and here you have an N. So potentially, uh, this part right here, you could express that way you know, with a, a bit of a, an articulation there and a legato here, right, because of the phonemes, right? Now, we as trombone players, when we see a staccato right here, we tend to separate the notes, and that's us being good ensemble technicians, and it's different when we're in the ensemble as opposed to carrying the musical line. What I want you to pay attention to is when you see a firm attack, like the Q or the T right here, um, how much space is there afterwards? And there's generally not a lot. And this is something that trombone players typically struggle with a great deal, brass players in general. When we play with a firm attack, we immediately start to play short. And if we're carrying a solo line, the cantabile is much more important than the length of the note. And so what I want you to pay attention to this time through, we're going to give it another listen. When we, uh, when, we, when we listen to it, pay attention to how much space there is in between words. It's very little. For like, for example, here, there's this comma here, and she took a breath but it was almost imperceptible, all right? So she's breathing very late, right, when she does, so that the phrase momentum continues on. Be aware of space and how little of it there is, because that's typically something that a trombone player will overdo when they start to transcri transcribe a vocal melody. Let's give it another listen. Uh, there we go.
quite a bit out of this. Uh, it's really fascinating. Uh, some of these, like if I were playing trombone, for example, um, some of these wide leaps, for example, um, here, right here, I'd want to try to make it through that in one breath. I heard once a really great idea that, um, you know, the audience need to breathe too. When you're when you're playing along, you could make a really long phrase, but it's like people get uncomfortable when they know that you're running out of air, and it's not always the end all be all to make the longest phrase ever, right? Um, so, oh, we lost Patrick. Come on back, Patrick. Um, so, all right. So at this point. We're going to listen to it again, and this time it would be a good idea to grab your rim. So what you're going to do is just try to emulate what you're hearing on your rim. Your, your lips look uh, uh, under a microscope if you, uh, if you put a, a scope down your throat, and you look at how your vocal cords work. They look really similar to your lips. In fact, when we sing with our lips, that's probably the, the best example that we could be going for is a, a beautiful singing voice. So what we're going to do is buzz on the rim along with this song that we know pretty well now because we're on our second and maybe even our third listen through. Okay? All right. So let's go back here to the beginning. Um, well, I keep on doing this. There we go. All right. That's beautiful. All right, so now, in uh, and this is honestly how I inform my warm up every day. I uh, listen to it. I listen to a, a nice short aria several times, taking phrase dictation, trying to be infected by this beautiful musicianship, the sound, uh, trying to be inspired by the tone production, and then I pick up my horn, cold, and I play it. Um, and I, I don't have high expectations um, because, you know, a couple of reasons why. I'm not trying to play Heldenleben here. I'm not trying to uh, win a job here. I'm just trying to sing with my lips. 
and I'm not I'm not trying to like play as loud as I can or as high as I can. I'm going to play this as written down an octave and do a quick sound check. If you guys on YouTube can let me know that the sound comes through all right, and as well in my uh, in my class on the Zoom call. Um, let me know that this is coming through well enough. And what I want you to do is just play along with me. And it's not going to be perfect, and that's okay. The idea is that you just get used to having fun and just kind of playing through this melody that you should know reasonably well right now. Uh, I can see my friends in the Zoom call uh, already taken off. Uh, can I get um, just some th thumbs up in the YouTube world to let me know the sound is coming through all right? <laughs> On the Zoom call, is that sounding all right? All right. I'm going to switch to original sound. That should be good. And on YouTube land, looking for thumbs up. I'm not really getting any. Oh, let's see here. Sound is coming through all right. Oh, nice. I can uh, see that that is coming through okay. All right, cool. Check on my own. All right, here we go. Uh, let's see. I, I don't want to uh, get too crazy with it. Try to play along with me. Hopefully, you've got your headphones on. I'm trying to infect you with my sound, but uh, let's give it a playthrough. Here we go. Uh, again, this is treble clef down an octave. Okay? I'll give you a count off, and then we're right in. One and uh, two and uh, one, two. cow that was fun um so, so here's the thing that i noticed i just want to give you a secret i'll tell you a secret just for showing up um i started doing this about five years ago and the way it is being a teacher in the world is like you come up like you're always if you're being a good teacher you're kind of experimenting a little bit right you, you're playing but you're not really maintaining you're always trying to get better and uh, in trying to get better, oftentimes you, you end up experimenting with different solutions, uh, things that your teachers remind you to try, like when you, you remember younger. But occasionally you come up with something you didn't weren't really told to do. And this is one of those things. And I was, uh, so I was like trying to play Mahler 3. I wasn't really happy with how I was playing. So I was like, I started listening to Dietrich Fischer Disco. And, uh, and, I noticed that when I would listen to Dietrich Fischer Discow and then I would play, my sound sounded a lot better and a lot easier than I was used to. And I didn't know why. This is troubling. A lot of times we, we want to know why. But I started to like let that be okay, that I didn't know why, and just enjoy the results. So here's the thing. As a teacher, you're like, wow, this is really cool. I'm glad this works for me. But you're like, maybe I'll try this with my students, but I'm not sure. I noticed with my students, like for me, it worked a lot. And for my students, it was a revolution, like a paradigm shift. Their sound was immediately better and, 
And again, the trouble is that we couldn't say exactly why. It was because your shoulder was back. It was because you were taking a deeper breath. It was because you buzzed more. That's what we want to say. You hold your tongue in the right spot, or like maybe, maybe uh, you you hold your your head up high when you go to play. Maybe you change your mouthpiece. Th these are the answers that we want it to be as trombone players. It's it's really hard to put your finger on it. Say like, well, I listened to something, and then I went to go play something completely different. Like for example, the difference between Dietrich Fischer Discal aria and Mahler Three. They're not the same thing. Right? But for some reason, one makes the other immeasurably better. And I can't say why. All I can say is that it worked. So I encourage you to explore this on your own. This is a, a, a cultural shift that we're looking for in your practice, that you would start in this way. Like, this is me playing cold, and I pick up the horn to play, and not only, I notice two things right off the bat. Number one, I'm having a great time, all right? And number two, the sound is like, wow, it's like I, I've already warmed up. Or something. I'm, I, I mean, there's some like discomfort a little bit, but in general, I'm just like enjoying how easy it is and how nice it sounds. Now, to be like completely fair, I'm like two days back from taking three weeks off. And these are the first notes of the day. I had gum graft surgery and like, I'm just like, well, I don't know what's going to come out the horn and here we go. And, and I'm noticing like right away that the sound is nice and the production is pretty good. And I'm like, I mean, there's always something to work on, but it's a lot easier than it should be, okay? And so, like, I'm hoping that you had this similar experience, and, like, I realize that it's a bit uh, sort of uh, maybe hackneyed or you know, deliberate. It's, it's a little weird to kind of do this in this way, this fashion, where you're, like, just trying to play along with me, and maybe, like, you know, we're not completely synced up. And you're like, oh, it's not in the same spot, and don't worry about it. Go do what I just did on your own and see how much it helps. All right, now, as you know, uh, like I'm going to be a little bit of a commercial. This is like a microcosm of what happens as a subscriber in TOBI, right? So, and you subscribe on my website. It's really easy, and it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's uh, $45 a month, and we meet at least three times a week, if not sometimes more, uh, just to try to do exactly this. And I'm talking through a lot of questions and concerns. We have topical master classes, um, but uh, we're having a great time. Uh, in a community-based setting, kind of with a lot more interaction, and this is the one of the the columns, one of the the, the main things that we do, and it's a new song every time we meet. Uh, so uh, I hope to see you there. If you're in YouTube land and you want to be more in the fold of what we're doing here, I I would love to see you. But uh, I wanted to see how everybody's feeling in the uh, in the master class. If right now we're running a a Zoom call simultaneously, and I'm letting uh, the people in YouTube land kind of like watch what we're up to. And I want to see if there's any classroom participation uh, questions in the Zoom world. Uh, do you have uh, like a playlist? A playlist? All these arias? Yeah. This is a, like go to. <laughs> it's called Toby's Warm Up Book, and it's coming, believe me. I'm, I'm about halfway through, I'm working with Sean Davern. Uh, to try to uh, get everything together because it's not just songs, it's actually a, a methodology. And if you wanted to take notes every time we meet, right, I'm basically giving you the warm up book one spoonful at a time. So if you're taking good notes and your attendance is good, uh, then you probably already have the warm up book, Patrick. <laughs> Patrick's there every time. Let's say, uh, Patrick and maybe maybe Brad, their their attendance is uh, is very high. I would think that you could easily plagiarize my book if you wanted to, but you're just you're not wired that way. I, you're very trustworthy. You wouldn't do that. Uh, but Ken, if you're looking to um, if you're looking to a uh, playlist, it's coming. I'm hoping to have something by the end of the summer. Uh, Sean's going to come out uh, to Tanglewood, and we're going to put the final touches on everything. Uh, but we're hoping to have something for you at the end of the summer. Again, if you wanted to just take diligent notes on the songs that I put in front of you, it's pretty much, I mean, there's some jewels that I haven't shared with you yet that are they're just too good. They're too good. Okay? Is the FOMO real? <laughs> it's a good question. Any other questions? All right, my friends, let's, um, let's do some long tones, shall we? Let me, uh, let me pull this up here. Um, I, oh, there we go. 
functional subsets. All right, that should work. And there we are. OK, now this is you know not remaking the wheel. The Remington-style long tones, they should be a, um, a meditative part of your practice. What you want to do is make sure that you don't go too far from the easy tone production that you had from listening to that beautiful aria, OK? Frequently, again, I, I want to uh, caution you against doing the, the, the dumb trombone player thing of turning long tones into an athletic event, OK? We're not looking for effort here. It should be beautiful sound as easily as possible. Um, uh, let me turn on a metronome for you so we can all play together. Now, this metronome is just to so that we start together. We're not going to hold these for a certain amount of beats. I invite you to just play them. It's one note per breath. And when you run out, you just wait for the next one to come up, OK? Remember, keep the effort level low, OK? I'm going to turn on a tuner just to keep myself honest. Um, nope. Go here. Try that one more time. There we go. OK. Here we go. always feels weird ending on a tritone. Um, let's give ourselves a little bit of a rest here. Um, oh, I see we have, I didn't have the comments up. Uh, oh, thanks, Anthony, for, for being on top of the comments there. Um, if you're looking for how to become a member of Toby, it's here in the comments. I think that's it. Uh, if that doesn't work, uh, just go to my website. You should see it there. It's in the upper left menus. Uh, I'd love to see you in the class if you can make it. Um, any other questions? Espinov, dear Mr. Toby, this is a very unusual question. I just can't decide between tenor and bass trombone, and this isn't affecting my studies. I realize that they are incompatible. Well, why do you have to choose? I mean, that is an interesting question. I'd be curious uh, what people would have to say about that. Um, Chris, I feel like you do a lot of doubling, right? I don't. No, you don't? This was my, my first experimentation with bass trombone. Uh, ah. I, I had to play it for a concert. There wasn't any way around it. Oh, I um, see. OK. Well, yeah. I mean, my take on it is like uh, typically, um, 
you know, I, I think that uh, I see career paths and, uh, you know, your life is, uh, a lot of times we want to describe it as a straight line. In fact, you might spin a narrative later on if you were like um, uh, telling people like I, I was in Topeka and then I moved to Buffalo. And it describes a sort of like linear nature to life, but it's actually more like um, like you're, you're in a canoe on a, on a river. It rarely goes in a straight line. I mean, you end up at your destination, but you kind of have to, you have a, an idea of where you want to go and you, and you also have to kind of go with the flow. As you're trying to decide between uh, bass trombone and tenor trombone, I would say uh, a lot of times you end up going where the opportunity is, and then also following what what you know you feel your your physicality is best suited for. Um, you know, I've I've met some people that just they seem like their body is built to play bass trombone better than tenor. I'm um, I'm a big fan of sort of being the architect of what you want out of life. So if that is if you feel like your voice is is more honest. With the tenor, but it's taking a bit more effort. Well, that's on you. Uh, you're, you you kind of have to find happiness where you can. But um, I know a few people that uh, are very talented doublers, and um, it's you know it's not a bad idea to um, to not make a choice. Just do both um, as well as you can. Uh, and there is always the uh, the adage that I find to be truth uh, is you know better be the master of one thing than the master of none. What is it? What do they say? What is that? Uh, uh, a person that does many things is master of none. Jack of all trades, master of none. Jack of all trades, master of none. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, that's, that's, that's the best way to put it. Um, let's see here. Just a couple more questions before we move on. Will the book that I spoke about be available to everyone or just your online studio? It'll be available to everybody, but the studio is obviously getting it early. You guys are, are all getting it early in TOBI. This is you're you're basically seeing everything sort of unfold. I'm I'm kind of experimenting uh, <laughs> to see. I, I I I judge a lot of how much things are going to go into the book based on your reactions. Believe it or not, um, embouchure is different. Positions are different. I have to decide. I am not improving. <laughs> Just I'm trying to decide. I love both. Um, I'd say I, I should probably take a step back. That's between you and your teacher. Um, the positions aren't all that different. The embouchure is slightly different. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd say go to where your voice feels the most honest. There's a, there's a like your artistic voice will, will guide you on that one. Your body will find a way. Um. You are a much better teacher of you than I will ever be. Okay? I can only offer you some advice, but uh, remember this thing to be true. Uh, let's play the next, let's play the next long tone set before we get too cold, shall we? Then I'll get to more questions. I'm going to turn this vertical. It might be easier to see. Um, there we go. Nice. And then potentially we can go like this. All right, here we go. Oh, I forgot to mention. Oh. And again, gravity. Here we go. Go ahead and play with me. I'm trying to infect you with my sound, so let's play together. Here we go. Ready? Uh.
I dropped my slide. That was scary. That was that was like I need a stump man. <laughs> Luckily, I have a little little stand on the edge of my stand that holds my my coffee cup. Believe it or not, I'm into coffee, uh, and it caught my slide. So that was uh, that was a win. Got the ISO here. All right. Uh, what about? Looks like Patrick, you want to say something? Oh, we got uh, latecomer here, Kevin Duga. All right, let's just keep on going. All right, let's. Uh, we're into long tones, Kevin. Uh, I presume you can see it there. Um, <laughs> We're going to do the low set, all right? If you want to jump on in with your horn, uh, that's the whole point. Uh, let me infect you with my sound. It's like we're in the same room together. Here we go. Not going to lie, like like bringing my face back, I'm hoping this works. I'm, I'm guessing that the tuner is going to go a little haywire because my embouchure doesn't feel quite yet stable from the long break that I had. Here we go. That makes my nose tickle. That's how I know I'm out of shape. You feel that like when you're coming back like from a long break, you feel your lips kind of tickle. And um, I used to be able to like, this is what I would do with my students when I was teaching high school and junior high students a lot more often. We would do long tones every lesson. We just run them through it. And I could always tell if they hadn't been practicing because when we do a low set, their nose would tickle, right? And I'm noticing just now that my nose tickle. <laughs> Because <laughs> after this, the gum graft surgery, uh, like a couple of weeks ago, I'm just kind of coming back, and it definitely like it, like my nose is like, oh, we, we haven't been doing this in a while. So uh, anyway, a uh, little little trick there. Let's jump into the lip slurs, unless there's any questions in the world. I don't see any. Um, Kevin, I want to check in with you, see how everything's going, uh, but let's get some lip slurs done first. Now. Uh, with lip slurs, we're looking for evenness, okay? Keep the sound super easy. Remember, we're not trying to be athletes here. We're trying to make it as beautiful as possible. And uh, the transitions being nice and easy, not railroad or like, uh, like a, a hard articulation, a hard slur. We want this to be nice and easy, nice and even uh, all the way through. So we're going to go relatively slow. And again, the whole point is for smoothness, right? Not for speed, not for athleticism. Let's see. Right around uh, this William Tell tempo. Oh, hey, Kelly Deathridge. Ah, it's nice to hear from you. <laughs> Hello, not a trombone player. Uh, <laughs> uh, I went to high school. Kelly Deathridge was a big part of that. Uh, that experience. That's nice to see you. All right, here we go. Uh, Let's 
start with number one. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> How'd that feel? Definitely. I, I noticed I was a little tight. I, that's why I chipped a note. I had to like, poof, I had to kind of reset there for a moment. If that happens to you, it's just a matter of like, relax. If we talk about posture, there's, there's something I was uh, noticing um, in uh, photography is that uh, when I'm uh, taking pictures of people, uh, if I get them to roll their shoulders back like this, right, and then let them drop, they, gr they look great. Right, that's typically how you get kind of your hero pose, right? But it actually works the same with the trombone. Elongate the distance between your ear and your shoulder. Take a deep breath, roll your shoulders back, right? And then just let them hang, all right? And what that does is it makes it so you don't have to lift your chest with every breath. This movement here is often the source of tightness, right? And our shoulders can get locked forward and we end up taking shallow breaths. And that disconnects us from our breath support. So as we're doing these nice, simple, easy exercises, let's make sure our shoulders are in the right spot, okay? I like the idea of essentially putting the base of my neck, oh, that's nice, all right. Uh, put the base of my neck over my tailbone, all right? All right, if you're, uh, if you're seated, make sure you're standing from the waist up, okay? <laughs> and if you're standing up like I am, it's a little bit easier to kind of put that, the base of your neck right over your tailbone, and that typically gets your shoulders back where we like them. All right, uh, let's go ahead and do the next lip slur. Um, keep it right about uh, William Tell tempo. Now again, these are triplets because I want you to focus on keeping everything even. You notice that uh, occasionally uh, the, the bottom note is on the beat and sometimes the top note is on the beat. And that's all because I want you to, to focus on keeping the tone quality even throughout. Not da, ah, 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 or di, ya, ya, all even. Di, ya, 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 okay? Um, here we go. With me. One, two, three. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's pretty awesome. Was that fun for you guys? That was good for me. There comes a point where you just kind of got to get out of the air, get, get out of the way of the air, and just kind of trust that and your embouchure to just kind of blow your way through the exercise. Sometimes it gets so fast, you move in your slide, you're kind of on autopilot for the technique. That's kind of what you want. Not entirely, but ideally the technique is in your periphery as you're concentrating so much on what you want to sound like. All right, you let your body find a way. Put your body, like set it up, set the chessboard as best you can so that you can win, and then focus on what you want to sound like. All right, let's do the next one. Oh yeah, a little bit of a disclaimer here. This, um, this right here, that's where people typically struggle. Now you got that F to D, 
slur, right? And you got to use your breath support to carry you through, and you should be particularly relaxed as you're doing so, all right? So make sure that your, your chest is relaxed and your face is relaxed so you, can, so you can be agile and make that jump, skipping the B-flat partial up to the D. This is really great practice. I think this uh, lip slur is from the Marsteller book, uh, book one, maybe book two. The basic slide routines and the advanced slide routines. There's some fantastic lip slurs in there. All right, here we go. This is too slow. When I want to be able to make it in one breath. Yeah. If you run into trouble and you can't do this, buzz it on the rim or the mouthpiece. All right? You'll still get the good out of it. All right? Go ahead and play with me. Let me infect you with my sound. You're just trying to give your brain a product here. Hopefully, you've got your headphones on and you're just playing along with me. All right, here we go. I'm going to give you two bars of three and then we're in. I'm not in good enough shape yet to play this. Hopefully you got that better than I did. Man. All right, so let's just keep on going. I don't, uh, I, I'm giving myself a pass on that one because from the surgery. Just I'm not quite agile enough to be able to get that low note out on the last one. <laughs> Boy, that's irritating. All right, let's keep going. So here we get to uh, one of my favorite parts, this one and the next one, number four and number five, right? So number four, you're going from a, a low note to a very high note, right? And number five, uh, obviously, that's the one of the more famous or exercises. Now, the trick to this is to try to figure out how to play your low note with your top note setting. Okay, so that means uh, in number four you've got a high D, and you play the D by itself, and then you play the B flat. You play the high D as best you can, and then you play the low B flat. All right, don't move. But typically, people get themselves into trouble because they're trying to play a high D with a low B flat set. We typically will have a shift at some point in there, and you're going to do better if you can um, identify um, <laughs> the upper embouchure and use that upper embouchure to, to, to be able to get the low stuff than the other way around, okay? This is uh, what I like to call the set for the money note. Set for the money note, okay, my friends? Um, I... I have a feeling people are ordering and I'm missing it. Nope, they're not. Okay, we're all good. All right, just making sure that I didn't. If, <laughs> if somebody puts an order in to join the Zoom call, uh, uh, put a note in the chat and I'll make sure that you have the link. All right? All right, so uh, moving on. This is number four. We're not going to go that fast. Right around tuba mirum tempo, about 72. That might be too quick. We'll find out. Okay. Again, uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to play this exactly how I want you to do it, which is to test the top note first. All right. Test the top note, the bottom note, and then play the exercise. So in the interval of the rest, that's when we're going to be doing that. All right. Uh, we're going to set you up for success here, not failure. All right. Um, be curious if you notice th uh, the same benefit that I do.
works. See how that goes? How's everybody in Zoom land? I just want to check on you guys. I've kind of been bowling through this. Any reactions, concerns, comments, criticisms? I can take it. Tell me. I, honestly, like I'm looking at the sea of faces that look weirdly satisfied. <laughs> so I'm, I'm assuming that this worked. These strategies worked for you? You know, thumbs up? Yeah. Yeah. Bravo to you guys. Um, let's, uh, let's keep going with the, the hard one, number five. Now, uh, for number five, we're going to do the same thing. Uh, and essentially, we're going to test the outer notes. Now, um, I keep on doing this, and I want you to use this strategy for your phrasing. Like when you have your solos, right? You have, maybe you're working on the Sulek, or uh, potentially you're working on the, uh, like, I, the way I learned this actually was the do to you. Uh, so like, what you want to do is identify where you're going to breathe, and then identify the outer edges of that phrase. And you can essentially turn your practice session into phrase-by-phrase -phrase practice of your solos or your excerpts. And all you got to do is use this same strategy. Play the top and bottom note, probably in that order, depending on where the money note is. Like, for example, Mahler 3, the money note is the bottom note, the low A, right? For a lot of these, uh, a lot of the, the phrases, it's a low A, and sometimes it's a low F. So I, I set my embouchure to have already covered the shift, if there is one. Right for the money note. Uh, so what you're doing here is informing a strategy for your practice session, right? Where you identify the money note, you play the outer edges of the phrase itself, and then you play the phrase as many times as you need to. The repetition there is on the phrase, right? And so I think a lot of people screw up and they they consider practicing their solos as in like starting from the upper left and going to the lower right of the page, right? But ideally, you're practicing a little more. Uh, you know, phrase by phrase at a time, kind of like an Arben's exercise. Insofar as you have exercise number number 16, and you just play that number 16 with a metronome until you have the repetition of getting it right enough time that you can trust that it'll be there on your worst day, right? So, uh, and the way that you would practice that essentially is to identify the top and the bottom of each phrase, and then you just practice with that session, or with that, uh, sorry, you practice with that strategy in mind. So let's do that uh, for this tricky one, number five. In fact, I'll turn it sideways so potentially you can see it better. Get me out of there. Like that. Ah. Right. There. There we go. That looks pretty good. Okay. So, uh, go to you. That's too slow. Maybe about 155 or so. Uh, again, if you can't play it this fast, you work up to it. Okay, uh, this is probably it's this fast uh, <laughs> because you have to go this fast to make it through in one breath. Okay, uh, but uh, we're gonna test it. We're gonna play the outer edges of each one uh, of each line uh, before we actually do it. Okay, and uh, and again, be be nice to me. I'm coming back from a long three week break, so we'll see how this even sounds. If I don't play it perfect, don't ju don't judge me too harshly. All right, here we go.
See how that works? Now, hopefully you are uh, able to surprise yourself with that. Uh, that's what I, I kind of uh, enjoy. When you figure out a new strategy like that, it's like, whoa, I actually can do something that I didn't think I could do. Um, I want to leave some, some time here after we're done with our lip slurs. Uh, actually, that's probably all the lip slurs that I want to play. Um, for time uh, for people to ask questions, have any comments, um, suggestions for future classes. Is there a way that uh, I can make this so you get more out of the experience? Um, I'm all ears. I like being able to play along, even if it's to my own failure at times. <laughs> you like being you able to, to play, even if it's not working. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that, like, like for example, we started, uh, you weren't here, Kevin, and I appreciate you saying that, uh, you know, because, like, um, myself included, like, I can tell you the times when my teacher spoke to me in a way that I felt like they believed in me, it really mattered. Um, these things were really helpful, and I encourage you, because I know many of you have your own students, to, to teach in this similar way. Uh, but I will tell you, um, the times that my teachers played for me, it almost mattered more, and that um, I felt like I was problem solving how to uh, produce similar sounds um, in, a, in a way that uh, describing the methodology could never accomplish. And uh, for that reason, that's why uh, in my lessons, as you know, I like to demonstrate quite a bit. Even if it's not working, I'm going to take like two or three times to try to figure it out until I do because I, I just am a big believer that um, you're going to learn uh, as much as possible this way, much more than if I'm just speaking about it. Uh, so um, I guess I'm trying to give myself an excuse for, uh, you know, faces coming back. And I realized that that wasn't perfect, but I hope that it was inspiring. Uh, there is a, uh, a sort of a familial culture in the trombone world, in the low brass world, where we all uh, are t kind of supporting each other. And, um, and to that end, I, I, I hope you, uh, you recognize that I'm happily uh, putting myself out there to be vulnerable, hoping that it will help you in some way, shape, or form. So um, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, Craig Hull asking if I will be um, continuing classes over the summer. This is something that's come up a fair amount. And um, yes, I will be. Uh, this is a big priority for me. The schedule might need to be adjusted. As you know, the, um, uh, we are doing Tanglewood in the Boston Symphony. And so we, I try to meet at least three times a week with TOBI. And we might need to adjust the schedule. And I won't do that without consulting the members, the subscribers uh, to the program. But uh, my plan is to continue it uh, throughout the summer and on into next year. Um, I believe that one of the things that uh, COVID has taught us all is that community is one of the most important aspects of succeeding, of your success, right? To, to create a supportive uh, community of trombone players is what I'm after. And we meet as often as I can. I try to be a positive force. If that's a, uh, hey, this aria is going to help you out, or if somebody's got a question, well, let's, let's flesh this out. Um, I'm here to support you being a better musician. So, and I'm going to do that for as long as I possibly can, and I foresee that um, this is a, it's a really cool thing, this, uh, this Zoom environment, this YouTube world, that, uh, this, this community that we've created. And I, I think that it's possible to keep it going uh, throughout the summer and on into the future. So, um, yes, the answer is yes, Craig Hull. Um, oh, <laughs> I've got high school friends <laughs> trolling me <laughs> in the YouTube comments. <laughs> All right, Sebastian. Uh, hi, Toby. Is it uh, normal that a note splits sometimes in the middle register? What can I do to help about that? So when you have a split, it's typically uh, because your lips are a little tight. And believe me, this happens to me. Typically when I'm tired, uh, I'm trying something new. Um, I would encourage you, when, when you have a note split, the first thing that you do is to grab the mouthpiece and buzz. Why? Because that split is the sound of the lips not buzzing. 
and they're tight enough that it's actually causing an explosion. They, they, they're tight enough that the lips stop buzzing and then they start with an explosion. So what you want to do is remind your body that playing the trombone is easy. And that's typically done really well, really effectively with the rim or the mouthpiece. You recognize that it's just air moving over flesh and it's not that big a deal. We can make it a big deal by turning it into a flex. And what we want to do is mitigate that issue. I, I realize it's kind of like, like climbing, climbing a rock face and that you're going to accomplish it as relaxed as possible. But there is such a thing as being so relaxed that you just fall off. This is kind of what it's like playing trombone. Loud, soft, high, low. There's a certain amount of tension that is necessary to get the job done. But especially when you're warming up, you're trying to eliminate that tension as, as, as easily as possible. Now, it's not so easy to just say, hey, relax. It's not that simple. So a lot of times what you have to do is coax your body into relaxing by uh, different therapies. Buzzing is typically the most effective therapy to try to remind your body that playing the trombone is easy. All right, and so what you'll do when you have a note split is to immediately grab the mouthpiece off and, and buzz through where the problem area is, right? And don't do it once, do it several times. All right, you're trying to teach your body to do something different. You, your playing is a collection of habits and much of your practice is to try to um, evolve your habits into something better than they were before. Today, you're the aggregate of all the habits of your playing up to today. So when you come up with a new way of playing, like being more relaxed, you have to reinforce it several times, thousands of times, unfortunately, um, to sort of like rewrite a new history, all right? Under pressure, your body always goes back to what it knows best, even if that's failure. So you have to practice is a lot of like you trying to recreate success, a history, a history of uh, more success than failure so that you can trust that that's what your body does by default. That's a really good question. All right. Well, I will say at this point, I'm not seeing a lot of comments in the YouTube world, and uh, Zoom seems to be relatively quiet. I just, um, again, if there's any anything else that you want to discuss, any questions that I can answer, at the very least, I'll look for you at office hours on Thursday. Uh, look forward to seeing everybody then. That'll be only for the subscribers of TOBI. Again, you can do that on the website. I try to uh, post on YouTube uh, a small part of what we're doing in TOBI. Uh, just for free for the trombone world, trombone community. Um, uh, so if you're in the YouTube world, potentially I'll see you next Sunday. Uh, but at the very least, for my uh, TOBI subscribers, I'll see you on office hours on Thursday. All right? Um, again, it was really great to see everybody. I hope you got a lot out of that aria. Go and listen to it again with the music. You know, in the, in the TOBI, I, I've given you the PDF, and you can listen to it. I would recommend that you listen to it three or four more times. Um, and, and be infected. Go ahead and play, uh, play with what you're seeing, that tone production and that beautiful vocalist. There's more than one recording out there. Please, like, to, more than one idea about where to breathe, how to uh, get the brilliant phrasing out there. But um, yeah, go in good health. Everybody uh, stay healthy and uh, hopefully I'll see you soon.